Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Ramakal. I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In my talk today, I'm going to talk to you about PFAS, which stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. These chemicals um, are found throughout Wisconsin, and I want to tell you a little bit about these chemicals and also the work that my group is doing on them. So uh, PFAS it refers to a group of over 5,000 different chemicals. We actually don't know how many of these chemicals there are. These chemicals are used in a lot of different things that we come in contact with every day. So for example, they're used to make things nonstick or waterproof. A good example of this are Teflon pans, as well as grease resistant paper, stain resistant carpeting. They're also used in industrial applications like chrome plating, and then they're commonly used in firefighting foams. Now, the reason why we care about these chemicals is because some PFAS can lead to a variety of health outcomes, things like thyroid disease, fertility issues, as well as um, cancer in some high exposed cases. These chemicals bioaccumulate. That means that once they're inside your body, it takes a long time for them to leave again. Um, all of us, all of you listening have PFAS in you. Um, so do I, they're, they're in all of us. One thing that's concerning is that the health effects for these chemicals happen at very low concentrations relative to other contaminants we might worry about. So to put that in perspective, the regulation that's being considered for two chemicals, PFOS and PFOA in Wisconsin is 20 nanograms per liter. Arsenic, which you might think of as being a toxin or a poison, is allowed to be at concentrations that are 500 times higher than that. Um, so we really are thinking about low concentrations. My work focuses on PFAS in the environment and their fate in water treatment systems. There's a lot of different ways that PFAS can get into the environment. They may come out in, in wastewater through industrial sources or landfills. These wastewaters end up at the wastewater treatment plant. These treatment plants are not, not a source of PFAS, but they're also not designed to remove them. That means that any PFAS that come in will come out the other end. They may end up in the water that might be discharged to a river or a lake, or they may end up in the solids. Some solids like the sludge might go back to the landfill. Other solids, like biosolids are land applied, especially here in Wisconsin on farm fields. They're actually used as like a fertilizer. And these are ways that we can distribute PFAS around the environment. Firefighting foams are a really important source of PFAS. Um, these foams are commonly used by military or at airports, but a lot of fire departments use them as well. And when these foams are used either for training or for, of course, fighting a fire and they're not contained, that can be a really dramatic source of PFAS to our aquatic systems. Humans are also exposed to PFAS through consumer products, you know, so your microwave popcorn bag, for example. And then another source that you might not think about is actually precipitation. Researchers in Wisconsin are measuring PFAS and precipitation, and yeah, we, it's there at low concentrations, but we can measure it. And so this is just a couple examples, a few sources of PFAS, but it hopefully gives you a sense of, there's a lot of different things we need to think about when we're considering these chemicals and sources. Now, once chem these chemicals are into the environment, it's important to think about what happens to them. Um, I put up the structure for PFOS, which is one of the chemicals that gets the most scrutiny because we know it's, it's actually pretty toxic and very persistent. And I put this up to show you how someone like me, an environmental chemist, what we think about when we look at these chemicals. There are three things that jump out to me. First is this long carbon backbone. This lipophilic um, carbon tail is what makes the chemicals lipophilic. It means they like to stick to fats or lipids or solids. And so the longer this chain is, the more likely it is that these chemicals will be in biota. So that means living things, fish, deer, people, and also sediments in the environment. It makes them more sticky. But on the other end is the exact opposite. This part of the chemical makes it really hydrophilic. It helps it dissolve in water. For thinking about this, this is really important because it means when we look for these chemicals out in the environment, we need to consider pretty much everything. Um, they dissolve freely in water. They can move around very easily, but they also can be found in living things, in sediments. 
Um, this dual nature is very problematic from an environmental fate perspective because they do move around so freely. It's also what makes them really desirable for a lot of consumer products. Um, and it's really different than a lot of classic contaminants like PCBs, which tend to be more sticky. The last thing to point out are all these Fs. These are fluorines. The carbon fluorine bond is one of the strongest bonds you can have in an organic chemical, and they're very hard to break. And this chemical has a lot of them, as you can see. Something like PFOS, we don't actually know any natural degradation processes for this chemical. Um, they last a very long time. That's, sometime, that's why they're sometimes called forever chemicals. Um, so all of these things at the molecular level make these chemicals very concerning from an environmental fate perspective. So given the fact that there's a lot of sources, these chemicals move freely and they last a long time, you know, it's perhaps not a surprise that we find PFAS in a lot of waters in Wisconsin. This map is from last year and it's actually, I think, pretty outdated at this point. The DNR is doing a lot of testing for PFAS and finding them in a lot of different places. But here are some major sites. You see a lot of you know, military airports and then up in Marinette along, um, along the Bay of Green Bay, we have the Tyco Fire Pr Products Facility. Um, at this facility they made and tested PFAS containing foams on site for a long time and there's extensive contamination in that region. My group is working there, focusing on PFAS in water and sediment and surface waters. So we're asking, what does this groundwater contamination mean for PFAS in rivers around the Bay of Green Bay and also in the sediments? We're really trying to understand how these chemicals move in the environment and to also inform remediation efforts. So to share a little bit of results, we're about a year into this project, which is funded by Wisconsin Sea Grant. We sampled about 40 different rivers around the Bay of Green Bay last summer, uh, both the water and sediment. Here's just one snapshot of data. This is just chemical concentrations measured in all these different tributaries. It starts, um, basically goes clockwise from Door County up into the Upper Peninsula as you move from left to right. And this is just the total chemical, the concentration of the PFAS we measured. And you can see it ranges quite a bit. And I put that 20 nanograms per liter proposed regulation um, just for comparison. So some rivers are, are in that range. We generally find lower concentrations in some of the big rivers, although if you take into account the mass of water in those rivers, they're actually pretty important sources to the bay. Um, and then we find high concentrations, hot spots in some smaller rivers that are impacted by PFAS sources. So the one that's really off the charts is a ditch that drains a Tyco facility. So not really a surprise there. One thing that we're also finding is that we find a lot more of these chemicals in sediment at the bottom of the river than we would expect based on laboratory experiments. Um, these chemicals don't always behave well. And this again has to do with that dual nature, the hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity of them. Um, we found about an order of magnitude more in the sediment than we might expect based on the laboratory experiments. This means, and we've also shown through testing, that sediments can be a source of PFAS once the water is cleaned up. And this is really important to think about when we're thinking about remediating these areas. Now, the last point I want to touch on is actionable science. I think it's really important that our work is informing, you know, things outside of the laboratory or, or academia. And so through this work, we collaborate very closely with state agencies, especially the Department of Natural Resources. Um, we work with them throughout the project, and it's really, we're asking, how can we adapt our research questions to meet key needs that they have at the state agencies? So for example, we're sh we'll share um, sample sites or experimental ideas with them and try to adapt them a little bit to answer questions that they have to inform their work as well. And I think this, this helps our work really have a big, important impact beyond just fundamental research. I am also um, honored to serve on the Wisconsin PFAS Action Council. This council was created by Governor Evers through an executive order, and it has 17 state agencies represented, and I'm the UW system representative on this group. We've worked over the past um, year and a half or so to develop a PFAS action plan, which went to the governor in December. And I encourage you to read it if you haven't already. There are some really um, important actionable ideas in this plan. 
everything from how do we prevent um, future contamination, how do we find out what we already have present, um, how do we clean it up, and how do we communicate um, risks about PFAS to the public. You know, through this work, we're also trying to build connections with other researchers and state agencies and try to bring academia to work together with our state agencies. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. With, with PFAS, there are more questions than answers. And so here's a list of just a few things, figuring out where we have contamination, what are the sources, understanding environmental fate, understanding toxicity for all of these different chemicals, and then developing new water treatment and containment techniques. These chemicals are very hard to degrade. Um, they're very challenging to us in the environmental engineering community. So there, there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, thank you all for listening. My contact info is there um, and I can be reached by email. Thank you.